Okay, thank you for joining us for the NSEC webinar Schedules of Work and Child Care in the National Survey of Early Care and Education. The point of this webinar is to introduce the NSEC Household Survey calendar data to describe issues related to how to make use of the parental employment data, um, including how to connect those data with data about what children are doing um, at, throughout their week, including when their parents are at work, and uh, further to highlight research questions that you might pursue as researchers um, that can take advantage of the parental work schedule data themselves, the combination of the parents' calendar and children's um, early care and education calendars, um, or perhaps other aspects of uh, research that can be conducted using these data. Um, to achieve those purposes, we will um, quickly overview the NSEC design, especially the design of the household survey and its contents. Um, we will talk about what kinds of research um, can be conducted about parental employment using the calendar data in particular. Uh, then we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of how this calendar uh, is structured, how we use those data. Um, we will uh, give some examples of variables that can be created using the calendar data, and uh, then we'll provide uh, information about how you can uh, direct your questions or find additional information about uh, the calendar data. Let's begin just with uh, some background on the study itself. So the National Survey of Early Care and Education uh, was sponsored by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in the Administration for Children and Families. Our federal project officer is Ivelisse Martinez-Beck. This is Rupa Dada of NORC. I'm the project director and will be uh, conducting today's webinar with my colleague Carolina Milesi, who is also here at NORC with me. Um, as you can see uh, from the slide, there uh, was a very large team of researchers uh, who participated in the construction of the data files and are now um, users of the data and potential resources uh, for understanding better how these data work. The NSCC was designed uh, to address several important policy needs having to do with uh, the work of the Administration for Children and Families. In particular, there were no comprehensive national data, especially about the supply of early care and education. Um, in addition, although there were household survey data, there were not data that linked households to the uh, access that they had locally to providers, as we know. Uh, you know, households in California are not helped by having centers in Virginia, and yet what data there were about supply were often at such a high level that they couldn't be linked to uh, local household data. Um, and so it was very important to the agency to understand all families with age-eligible children in a particular location. Uh, much of the data that existed was about specific programs, so children participating in Head Start, or um, children of working family, working parents. And so some of the most important policy needs were to understand comprehensively the full spectrum of families or um, providers that were available. And uh, in terms of understanding the supply, both center-based providers of care were important as well as home-based providers of care uh, who were known to provide a vast proportion of the care uh, that children receive, um, but no one uh, really knew what proportion. Um, and then also the issues of the workforce, uh, characterizing accurately the workforce of teachers and caregivers in early care and education was a critical objective. Um, and as I mentioned, doing all of this in a way that um, could connect supply, demand, and the workforce 
um, at a level um, below the na national summary statistics. So in response to these policy needs, the NSCC was designed as an integrated set of four surveys. Um, today we will be talking primarily about the household survey, which is a survey of all households with children under 13, which is a survey representing all households with children under 13. Uh, the other three surveys in the suite are of home-based providers, regularly providing care to children under 13, center-based providers uh, providing EC to children not yet in kindergarten, and the staff who work in those centers. Um, the data co were collected in 2012. Uh, so since this topic is about the household survey, we'll spend a few moments with some of the basic details about that survey. Uh, the NSCC household survey data file covers 11,629 households, who amongst them include 21,665 children under 13. Uh, the data were collected between January and June in 2012, and because low-income families are of such great policy interest, uh, especially to ACF, um, there was an oversample of households in low-income areas. Please note that a household in a low-income area may not itself be a low-income household, um, but rather a household who lives in an area with many other households who are um, who have low incomes. The respondent of the household survey was an individual who was knowledgeable about the early care and education usage and schedule of the youngest child in the household. So most commonly, there was a mother, um, could have also been a father. Uh, in more uh, rare con uh, circumstances, it might have been a stepmother or a grandmother or another or guardian or adult. Um, so as we talk about different units of observation within the survey, um, we'll talk about different adults on whom we have employment data, we'll talk about different children. It's important to keep in mind that although we have data about various members of the household, they all come from one respondent who is reporting about generally herself as well as a proxy of um, her spouse, other adults in the household, as well as the children in the household. Uh, the topics of the household survey questionnaire included basic household characteristics, like who lived in the household, um, income, uh, the type of dwelling, things like that. Um, we collected data on the perceptions of different types of care and the actual um, most recent search for EC. Uh, we asked questions about the cost to the household of their regular EC arrangements as well as their current usage of both regular and irregular care. Um, data are collected individually for each child under 13. Um, and as I mentioned, there's no focal child in the study, so every child under 13 was treated equally within the household. Um, and then the focus of today's uh, presentation is really on the calendar which focused on activities during the prior week. So the interview was conducted sometime between January and June of 2012 and whatever day of the week uh, the interview took place we asked about the prior uh, week uh, from um, Monday to Sunday uh, and there was uh, there were questions about each child and we generally describe that as the child calendar, and we uh, asked questions about um, the work-related activities of parents and resident caregivers, and we use the um, nickname adult calendar for that set of information. You'll find that the calendar data themselves uh, can't really be used without um, linking them to something else within the household survey data. They're very detailed information about activities in the prior week, but um, they're not analytically useful generally without linking to something else. And so it might be useful um, to think about what the other types of data are within the survey that can be um, used in conjunction. And so, for example, we have 
uh, a unit of observation, a set of data about the respondent, who, as we said, was generally the mother, but could have been another adult in the household. So the respondent's work schedule, demographics, things like that are available. There are data about other household members, um, both adults and children. There are household level data, and so analyses can be done at the level of the household, um, for example, in common program participation data. Um, there are um, both parents and caregivers in the adult calendar. I should mention those are um, resident caregivers, people who live within the household. Um, as I said, there are data on the most recent search um, for ECE. Uh, each child under 13 um, can be treated as a separate unit of observation, and so analyses can be done at the child level uh, as well as, as the adult um, household level. Um, and then two other uh, units of observation about which there are a great deal of richness of information are the providers used by the household in the prior week, as well as um, all regular arrangements, which by which we mean uh, the combination of a provider with a child, that pair we call the arrangement. Okay, well that is the introduction to the household survey. I'll turn it over now to Carolina, uh, who will talk more specifically about the parental employment. So we will cover the details of the adult calendar later in the webinar, but we first wanted to give you some examples of what um, you can learn about parental employment from the NCC household sur survey, and what are the substan substantive issues you could uh, tackle based on this data. Um, the adult calendar data are very rich, and you could examine multiple issues regarding parental employment. So we will just give you a couple of examples that we could uh, that you could. Uh, uh, used to spark your interest in using the data. So based on the adult, on uh, data from the adult calendar, you could ask uh, what are the characteristics of households in which parents work non-standard hours? And for this question, you would need uh, to use data of the adult calendar combined with data from the household uh, data file. Another question you could ask is, do parents of young children have different work schedules from parents of older children? And here you would combine data from the adult calendar with data on children characteristics in the main household data file. So note that in both questions, uh, the issue is not just the number of hours that parents work, but the timing of work, or in other words, when does that work take place? And the issue of timing is something that the calendar data are particularly well suited to address because you have data uh, not just a summary of a report on the number of hours, but actually how that work unfolded throughout the reference week. So in this slide, you can see uh, two examples of questions you can address using the combination of adult calendar and child calendar. The first question is, what types of non-parental care do children experience when parents are at work, school, or training? And does this vary by child's age? So note here that you could address this question as differences between households and also as differences within households, since the NCCE includes all children under age 13 in the household and not just the focal child. So you know households may prioritize or may allocate resources depending on children's age, for instance, and you are able to do that in the, with using the NCCE data. The second question that you, uh, as an, that's set as an example here is, what are the characteristics of households we, uh, with all parents employed in which children have no regular non-parental care? So imagine a household in which both parents work and children sp spend no hours in regular non-parental care. Um, is parental care similarly uh, uh, the same for each parent? Is the work schedule of these parents different than those parents whose children have regular uh, non-parental care? So these are some of the substantive issues the NCCE household data would allow you to explore. So in this section, I will now cover the content and the mechanics of the calendar file. The, uh, as Rupa had mentioned, the core of the calendar, the adult calendar, regards parental employment and school schedule for the prior week. And the code, there are three key elements to the code frame. Um, there is work. Um, you would know whether the parent or the caregiver was at a, in school or in training, 
And then the inferred category of all these three is no work, school, or training. So not here that uh, you would know that the parent was either work at work, or this is the caregiver, or the parent was either at work, school, or training, and then something else. But you wouldn't know specifically what that something else was. And commuting was included in the report of work, school, or training. The data was captured in 15-minute increments for the entire reference week. And as Rupa had mentioned, the reference week is Monday from uh, midnight to uh, 12 a.m. to Sunday, 11.59 p.m. of the week uh, immediately prior to the week of the interview. Um, so that's for the content. And then this slide shows the original questions asked to the respondent of the household questionnaire. And I will go through each question so that you understand how the adult calendar uh, data uh, was captured. So the first question is asked to the household, the respondent of the household questionnaire is thinking about last, let's say Monday, uh, did you go to work, school or training? And then there will be a drop, drop down menu with all those three options. At what time did you begin work, school or training on that last Monday? Please include the time you spent commuting to and from work, school or training in your response and the interviewer would record the start time. Then at what time did you end that work, school or training on that last Monday and the interviewer would record the end time. And did you attend work, school or training any other time that day? So the activities are reported iter iter iteratively up to five spells per day. And for each activity, the interviewer collected information on the start time and the end time. And these activities were captured for the respondent and also for the relevant adults in the household that I will refer to in a minute. So this is the core of the adult calendar. These are the core questions. And then you will see how the, how, how the data was structured. So in this slide, you see how the collection of the calendar uh, was aligned between the, what we are referring to as the adult calendar and the child calendar. So le let me walk you through this example. So in the, um, uh, in the first two rows refer to the respondent and other adult in the household. The last two rows here refer to two children in the household. And this is a totally hypothetical household by the, uh, household by the way. The columns represent five different time slots. Each of them covers 15 minutes and the time displayed represents the start time of each slot. So you see 8 a.m., 8.15, and then there's something in between, a lot of time in between, 3.30, 5 p.m., and 10 p.m. So as an example, you could see that at 5 p.m., the parent was working, and the second adult was also working, child one was at a play date with Chloe, and child two was being taken care for by Nanny Rosie. So uh, based on this data, you could create multiple variables, such as the number of hours that each adult uh, is at work, um, each particular day of the week, whether those hours are at the same the same during the weekday versus the weekend, whether the ch the children were with parents, um, sorry, wh where the children were when parents were at work, who was providing care when one of when one of both parents were at work and whether the providers, the providers were consistent throughout the week. So all those um, variables you could create by aligning the child calendar with the adult calendar. And in terms of analysis, it's important to know that the slots are the same for the adult and the children. So this feature of the data collection is what allows users to analyze the intersection of adult and children's schedules. So in this slide, um, there are two key issues that I will refer to. Um, the, the, the key one here is uh, who was the adult calendar data collected about? So as Rupa referred to, the adult calendar was reported by the same person who uh, responded to the entire household questionnaire. And that person reported on anyone whose work, school or training may be affected by childcare. So uh, that may or may not coincide with all household members, and it may likely be a subset of the household members in the household. Um, so the uh, adult calendar was collected for the respondent to the household questionnaire, his or her spouse, 
any parent of an eligible child who was living in the household under age 13, and any household member age 13 or older who regularly provided five or more hours of care to eligible children in the household. So for instance, in this last category, you would capture um, an older sibling or a grandmother or an uncle or an aunt who provides care for children under age 13 in the household. Um, and so this may mean that even though we refer to the adult calendar as quote unquote the adult calendar, you may have here um, non-adults such as an older sibling age 17 or 16 who takes care of a younger sibling under age 13 in the household. And based on the definition of who are the eligible adult, adults for the household, you would also note that some people, some household members who live in the household would not be included. So for instance, uh, the adult brother of a respondent who does not provide for care for the children on a regular basis, he would not be included in the uh, adult calendar, but he would be included in the household roster, and there would be information about that person in the household roster. So, um, from an analysis point of view, the set of adults with available data in the adult calendar are not necessarily a meaningful universe. You would probably need data from the um, a main household data file to link it to uh, the adult calendar to know who those adults were and whether th they uh, belong or do not belong to your analysis and your uh, relevant analytic example. Um, and the last point of the slide is, again, to remind you that the reference week is Monday through Sunday of the week, mostly, uh, most recently preceding the interview date. So, um, there, as I had uh, alluded to, there is uh, additional information about adults in the household, in the main household data file. There is demographic information on each adult, such as uh, sex, age, race, ethnicity, relationship to the questionnaire respondent, and relationship to children. And there is a lot of household level information that you could also link to the adult calendar, such as income, household composition, a geographic location, and characteristics of the communities where the households are located. The, some of the geographic location information will be available in the public use file, and some of it will be available in the restricted use file, depending on the level of detail. Um, there is also a lot of additional information about parental employment in the main household data file. So in the adult calendar you know where they were, but in the main data file you would know the characteristics of that employment such as occupation, industry, wage, hours per week, advance notice for days or hours needed at work, distance from the household to the workplace, and schedule changes in the last three months that are due to childcare related reasons such as uh, missed days of work because of the child being sick or uh, working late because the, uh, working late or leaving early because of childcare related reasons. And in the main household data file you're also able to identify parents among all those household adults. So some of the household adults that provide care for children uh, may not be the parents of those households and you would identify those relationships in the main uh, data file. So a note about the calendar data file. The calendar data file, file are included in a separate file from the main household file um, and you, the data is uh, entirely public and you could download the data from uh, the research connections link that is provided in the deck of slides. Uh, the calendar file is structured as a large rectangular file in which there is one record per household, so the file will have 11,629 records. An adult and child calendar are set up as separate variables for each of the 15-minute time slots. So there is a, to there is, you know, a, a lot of variables, almost uh, 16,000 variables. and. Um, there are some of the variables are not particularly meaningful because there are up to nine children per household and up to 12 adults per household and for households that do not have those many children or those many adults those variables will be empty but all the data is there uh, and uh, 
it's uh, so it's very likely that you may have to restructure the file in a way that suits your analytic purposes. You could restructure the file, for instance, as a child level file. You could restructure the file as a day file in which each record is a day per child, or you could restructure it as a very with a very small uh, category such as a time slot level, and then create the, your variables at that level, and then reshape it again, restructure it again at the child level. It's also very likely that you will have to merge the calendar file with the main household data file that we have been discussing here. Um, it, the merging is very easy because both files have the same ID, and it's also easy because uh, children and adults have the same index numbers across files to facilitate linkage. So the household member number three in the calendar is also household member number three in the main household data file, and child number five in the calendar is also child number five in the main household data file. Uh, it's important uh, for users to know that they should use weights when generating estimates in order to account for the complex NACCE design, and the calendar data file can be used with either the household level file, the household level weight, or the child level sampling weight, depending on the analysis that the user uh, undertakes. So, for instance, um, you would need the child level weight if you are asking about whether each child in the household experiences parents with a particular work schedule, and you would need the household level weight if you are asking whether any child in the household experiences uh, the same, uh, uh, same non-parental care, or how do households with two parents organize their work schedules, as opposed to households with one parent. Um, to conclude this section, uh, there are a, a couple of potential limitations that users should be aware of. Uh, as I had mentioned, parents' activities other than work, school, training are not known. Um, commuting time is included in the respondents' report of work, school, or training. Um, the data, as Rupa had mentioned, was collected uh, between January and June of 2012. So if you are interested in particular industries or uh, occupations that have seasonal employment that is not captured by that time, uh, you would need to be aware of that. Uh, and you would need some computing processing time needed to work with the calendar data. So here again, I will um, recommend that you restructure the data in a way that facilitates the variable creation and analysis. And with that, I turn it over to Rupa. So we thought it would be helpful to uh, actually show an example analysis that makes use of these data to give you some taste of the types of things we can learn. Uh, what I'll be presenting to you here are uh, child level estimates uh, that uh, derive constructs from the adult calendar and that are focused on children uh, ages 0 through 60 months uh, living in households with either one or two adults. So we begin by looking at the total number of work related hours that parents spent in the reference week. So there's a lot going on on this slide. Let me orient you briefly to it. Um, on the vertical axis, we have the total number of hours worked by all of the parents in the household. Um, and then the uh, horizontal axis uh, gives you sets of bars uh, that characterize households. So the first set of bars is for all working, all uh, working households. So at least one parent is working in each household that we show. Uh, in the second set of bars, now we're looking at households in which there is exactly one parent and that parent is a working parent. Uh, the next set is when there are two parents in the household, but exactly one of them is working. So we have one parent who had work-related activities in the prior week and one parent who did not have work-related activities in the prior week. And then the final set of bars is for two parent households in which both parents are working. So now we've got, uh, we're distinguishing uh, between households, we're looking at household structure, whether there's one parent or two parent in the household, as well as uh, what fraction of the parents in the household are working. And then the final dimension that we have here is the household's uh, income to poverty ratio. And so we are showing uh, the different colored bars for households uh, where we compare their income in 2011 
to the federal poverty threshold for a household of their magnitude, of their size. And so, for example, we see in the first set of bars that across all working households um, that had a child between zero and 60 months, um, the, on average, uh, the combined number of hours worked by parents was 58. So 58 hours of work in the reference week. Um, that it comes from, for example, on average, 37 hours uh, in the week for a single parent who is working, uh, combined with uh, 47 hours per week uh, for the sole working parent in a two-parent household, and 80 hours uh, for the two-parent, two-worker household. Um, so just pausing there for a moment, you see that the single working parent was working on average 37 hours, uh, in the two-parent, two-worker household, the combined total 80 would suggest an average of about 40 hours per working adult. Um, but where there are two parents and only one worker, there's a greater 47 hours of work in the week. So when you have an extra parent, um, the working parent is able to work more hours. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, for all working households, which is the leftmost set of bars, as well as for the two working parent households, which are the rightmost bars, you, you see an increase in hours of work by income category, so that the um, highest income households are working more hours than uh, lower income households, although um, all of the uh, parents um, on average, every category of parent is working significant numbers of hours per week. The lowest uh, average we see across any of these categories is 33 hours per week among um, uh, parents, single working parents in poor households. Okay, so these are uh, child level estimates for the total number of hours that their parents worked in the reference week. Now we are going to look at this next slide. Uh, of those hours that we just looked at, what fraction of them were worked during non-standard hours? And so uh, we use the definition that is uh, appears in much of the literature. So Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. through 6 p.m. are defined as uh, standard hours and everything else, evenings, weekends, um, early mornings or late nights, are considered non-standard hours. And here we see that, um, for example, across all children, zero to 60 months, um, who are in working households, so who have at least one working parent um, in the reference week, um, uh, across all children, they experienced 14 hours when at least one parent um, was uh, working uh, uh, during a non-standard hour. And you see that uh, the dark blue bars are the ones for the highest income households, and uh, typically across all of the household structures, um, those highest income households are working the fewest non-standard hours um, compared to the lower income households. Um, but we also see that across all of these groups, there is um, some uh, work during non-standard hours on average for every single group. Um, okay, so the two estimates that I just showed you, total number of hours worked, as well as total number of non-standard hours worked uh, could be generated from a variety of data sources. You can, from summary survey data, generate those numbers. What we're going to show you now actually can only be generated using the type of data that we've collected and make available in the adult calendar data. So what we've done here now is focus not just on the total number of hours, but on the relationship of those hours um, during the day and during the week to one another. 
So the question is, how many hours per week are all parents in the household working? Um, for a single parent, single worker household, this is the same as any hour that they're working. That's if there's only one parent um, and that person is working, then whenever that person is working, all the parents in the household are working. However, the concept is more interesting for two parent, two worker households. Here, we can think about whether um, the parents are working all of their hours at the same time or whether they are staggering their work schedules in different ways. So you might recall that in uh, the prior slide, uh, we saw that the total number of hours on average um, being worked uh, by two parent, two worker uh, households was 80 hours. So uh, children were experiencing 80 hours of parental work um, if they were in a two parent, two worker household. Now, if you just think about that, if you have two parents who are working a total of 80 hours, then uh, if they worked exactly the same schedule, then you would have 40 hours when they were both at work. But what we see on this slide is that uh, those children are experiencing 22 hours when both of their parents are at work, suggesting that the remaining time one of the parents is at work, but the other one is not, or of course it could be the case that neither parent is at work. And so this is a significant shift from what you might expect if parents were working exactly the same, say, standard work schedule. And so although in the what we were seeing previously was that uh, each working parent works similar numbers of hours, something between 30 and 40 on average, um, here you see that uh, children with in single parent households with working parents are experiencing on average 37 hours when their only parent is at work, when they have no parents at home. In contrast, if you're an, a child in a two parent, two working uh, parent household, in fact, you have on average 22 hours when both parents, when all of the parents in the household are at work. We can think about this as a hint of when parents need childcare to support their parental employment, and you can see that single working parents would need much more time to support their employment than uh, two parent households would need to support their employment even when both parents are working. Okay, um, so that's an illustration of how these uh, data can be used uh, in conjunction with one another to learn things that we've really uh, not been able to measure previously. Um, because uh, we presume that you're researchers, uh, you would probably like to know a little bit more about what types of analyses might be feasible. Um, what this slide tells you is basically the unweighted numbers of cases that we had available to generate the slides that you just saw. So for example, um, in our uh, sample, if you restrict to the number of children who are uh, between zero and 60 months old who have um, exactly one or two parents in the household, um, we see that um, there are a total of 7,900 such children, 7,918. Um, and because of the significant oversample of um, households in uh, low-income areas, you see that um, 31, 38 of them are living in poverty. Um, and that's in that less than 100% column. Um, you can see that we have about twice as many children in single-parent households as in two-parent households. Uh, I'm sorry, at about twice as many children, almost 4,000, who are living in a household with exactly one parent who works compared to about 2,000 children who are living in a household with two parents who work. Um, of course, you, there are 
um, a variety of ways to have one working parent. Um, one of them is to be in a single parent household where that one parent works. Another is to live in a two parent household where one of the parents is engaged in uh, work related activities. Okay, well that is a quick uh, introduction to the parental employment data. If you have questions about the data and how you can use them, uh, we would refer you first to the NSCC resources page at Research Connections, which is linked here and um, which is constantly uh, growing with new and different resources about how to make use of the data. Um, we have available a video that shows um, how the interview data were actually collected. Uh, we showed you a slide with a little demo, but you can actually go through the entire interview to better understand those dynamics. And we always welcome questions about the data and how to use them. Uh, and you can uh, get that help by emailing us at nscc.norc.org, as you see on this slide. Thank you very much.